Being only a part one of the complete Rebel Moon story, A Child of Fire did its best to leave audiences with questions and theories to be answered in April when the second part hits Netflix. But one of these secret reveals being saved for part two may have been revealed a little too soon. Although audiences can assume that Princess Issa died well before the events of Rebel Moon, multiple details suggest that this may very well not be the case, something that was supposed to be a big reveal in part two, The Scargiver. Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire, kicks off Zack Snyder's brand new original sci-fi fantasy universe on Netflix, and that comes with thousands of years of established history, featuring the rise and fall of kings and plenty of palace intrigue. The death of the king and the royal family is the backdrop for the state of the galaxy at the start of Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire, leading to the more vicious and conquest-focused mother world that we meet in the film. It's only addressed in a few lines of dialogue, but it's enough to paint a fairly accurate picture of what happened. In the opening monologue from Jimmy, all he says about the death of the slain king and the royal family is that, quote, treachery of an assassin's blade struck down the king and queen. He gives a little more detail to Sam, the water girl from Velt, by the side of the river late in the movie. On the day of Princess Iso's coronation, she, along with our honored king and queen, were assassinated in cold blood by those they trusted most. Despite the seemingly irrefutable confirmation that the entire royal family was slain, leading to Balisaris' rule as regent in the king's absence, I ended this film with a feeling in my gut that something wasn't adding up. Something that we were told didn't make any sense. And after re-watching and looking more into it, I became convinced that Princess Issa is in fact alive, and will have a big role to play in part 2 coming in April. For one, Jimmy, who was one of the several identical androids created to defend the King of the Galactic Empire, and later repurposed by the Imperium to do their heavy lifting, explicitly states when he's activated on Velt by Private Eris that he no longer fights since the death of the royal family. After the king and his family were slain, they were rendered purposeless, now only capable of doing grunt work, rather than fighting for a dead cause. However, after being befriended by the local farm girl Sam, while he was cleaning himself off in the river, someone who reminded Jimmy of the young Princess Issa, who he was programmed to love and protect, something inside of the android changed. Because when Sam was forcibly taken by the military unit, Jimmy made his own decision to fire on the commanding officer to free Sam, despite other orders. Obviously, there's a reason for this other than a one-off moment of sentimentality, and although the android fled and was never seen until the closing minutes of the film, hence we didn't get an explanation, this moment points towards Jimmy recognizing Sam as the previously assumed it killed, Princess Issa, thus restoring his purpose to fight and defend the royal family. The key moment here is when Sam gently lays her hand on the droid's face, causing the lights to flutter. Although this can easily be assumed to be part of his programming, it could also have been him sensing the familiarity of the person in front of him. This would also explain why Anthony Hopkins was cast to voice a character that barely appeared in the first film. He's a big name deserving more than a few minutes of screen time. However, the larger portion of his role will likely come in part two, as will that of Sam. If she does indeed turn out to be Princess Issa, which seems likely given not only the small details, but also the spotlight seemingly shown on this random farming girl, then she would also have a large part to play in Rebel Moon Part 2 as the rightful heir to the throne. The big question spawning from all of this is how did Sam, or Princess Issa, survive with everyone assuming she was killed alongside her parents? And this is more than likely answered by Korra, who was the girl's personal bodyguard. She would have faked Issa's death, and brought her to Velt in the far reaches of the galaxy where no one would ever find her. The question here though is if Korra was complicit and aware of the plot to kill the royal family, and at the last second had a change in heart, deciding to take the young girl and flee, or if she was as surprised as anyone when the king was murdered causing her to take Issa and protect her away from where she would undoubtedly be in constant danger from assassins. This would also answer the question of why Korra is wanted. Although the reason for her actions may not be known to the general person part of the mother world, her desertion was likely a result of fleeing with the girl to hide and protect her. And as a result, she would do anything in her power to protect Velt and its villagers until the time is right for Sam to reclaim the throne as Princess Issa. This was probably a story detail meant to stay unknown before it's revealed in part 2, but if it is as likely to happen as I and many others online believe it to be, then I think it does make me look forward to part 2 a little more after being disappointed by part 1. Did you enjoy part 1? Let me know in the comments below. Remember to like the video and subscribe for more Rebel Moon content as the new franchise gets underway. And remember to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Thank you all for watching, and remember, the Force will be with you. Always.